Welcome back to another episode of MJ's Progress Not Perfection. Today's guest is my good friend Jules Muck. Jules is in town on her tour as usual and we went out and we painted all over town. Right now that's what you're seeing on the screen. If you are listening to this, maybe check this out on YouTube when you get a chance. Um, this episode has a lot of bonuses. Um, since Jules is, you know, a pretty famous muralist and graffiti artist all over the world, I decided to add a lot of her, you know, paintings in there to show, like, you know, what she can do, you know, what she does, what kind of style she has. Um, in this interview, we'd go over, you know, her history with painting, her history with addiction, and her history with recovery. Uh, I met her in meetings when I first got sober, and she's been a great sober person to, like, mentor um, that I've looked up to and always, like, went to for suggestions, took suggestions from, you know, and just talked sobriety, talked addiction, and just try to pick her brain any chance I could. If you've ever noticed that I have, you know, a couple tattoos, she did most of them in her front yard in Venice when I lived out there. If you ever noticed the Bill Murray Jesus or the Mount Rushmore of comedians behind me or the bunnies that are humping behind me, that is also compliments of Jules. She is fucking awesome. I'm so glad that she sat down, you know, we sat down at four o'clock in the morning to do this interview. And it was totally worth waking up early for because I have heard her speak a bunch of times in LA when I lived out there. But, you know, it was different to be able to like, go back and forth and have the conversation, you know, and say, what about this? What about that? You know, usually when I heard her speak, it was, she's on a podium and, you know, it just like anybody else. But so this was, this was really cool. I really enjoyed it. And I hope you really enjoy it too. Welcome to the show, Jules. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's cool to be here. It's so awesome that I love whenever you visit. Yeah. Like, we always have so much fun together. And like wherever we go, like today, I've never gone out with you. Like today was awesome. And well, last night, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this is going to be out next week, but you know, this is the day after, but yeah, let's get into your story because I haven't heard you talk about it for a while. Jeez. Yeah. It's what, been a while. <laughs> what is your most recent sober date? Um, uh, my most recent sober date is April 1st, April Fool's Day of 2013. Did you think you'd make it with having a sober date of April 1st, or do you think that was going to, like, fuel you? Um, honestly, <laughs> like, I didn't think about it at first. I just took the date, you know, and I was with a friend, though. It was funny, because I was kicking, and he, he was like, well, because I told everyone, I was like, I'm coming back, I'm coming back, you know, and I was kicking, I was miserable, and he was like, you know, you could always just say April Fool's. And not get sober. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> that is awesome. Like, but. Yeah. Well. But what was your main drug of choice that made you, like, lose control all the time? I mean, they all were bad. And I would even say, like, with alcohol for me, it was bad because it was, like, the most embarrassing. But um, with my particular, like, mental conditions, the thing that hurt me the most was the thing that was good for me. Like, um, opiates helped my bipolar 100% and made me functional and I was able to get A's in school. But eventually the physical part was, um, they depleted my ability to breathe. You know, and that wasn't, I was a very cautious user. I didn't OD, but um, it still took away my lung capacity and I would get, um, I ended up being ho hospitalized with uh, my lungs, I guess, filled up with fluid. It's sometimes called a lung freeze. So I don't fully understand the medical part of it, but I've talked to other people that have had it happen from opiates. And I wasn't smoking it. Like, I, I was injecting, but it still attacked my lungs. So um, I'm a, I am an asthmatic. I told you I have a history from 9-11 also of being outside when um, there was a lot of freon in the air and yeah. stuff. So my lungs aren't great anyway. And the opiates caused me to like, in the end, like not be able to breathe. And, um, and that's what I was faced with when I got sober. I was faced with the option of basically like dying, doing one more shot and losing that last little percentage of lung capacity I had. I was like breathing like eh, 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 when I got sober. And, uh, and I didn't know if it was gonna come back. 
Like there was no guarantee that my lung capacity would come back, but there was a guarantee that if I did it like a couple more, maybe one more time that night, I would have uh, passed away. And, um, you know, I, I did, I made a choice. I made a choice to, to not do it. So now, like, we're different kinds of artists, obviously. Like, I was uh, more of a writer, and I performed a lot when I got sober. I was doing stand-up a lot, like, four or five times a week before I went into rehab. Like, that's what I was really into when I got into rehab. And the one thing I was, like, afraid of was, like, what's going to happen to my art artistic integrity? Because you've been painting 30 years, and you're not sober 30 years. So, like, was there any concern? Like, I know at least with, like, comedians and, like, artists were, like, that's part of our craft. That's where we find our magic. That's where we, and that was like our excuse, our, like our hideaway, like I need this for this. And it was kind of like, you know, a crutch. Now, was there anything like, did you, you know, obviously it wouldn't be true for an art art. It'd be better if you're sober, but you know, when we're that messed up, is there anything that was going through your mind like, oh, maybe this is going to affect my art? Well, you know, it did affect me. It, it, the transition affected me more than anything else. Like, when I stopped using, I became less functional because I'm an extremely functional user. And I had to kind of be okay with that. Like, when I got sober, um, I was kind of like, I don't give a crap if my art is gone. Like, I want to get sober. Like, that was my primary concern, and it was what I had to focus on. And I was okay. I remember thinking, uh, especially the first time I got sober, so I had two sobrieties, so I had a little experience the second time, and I knew that whatever was possible. But when I first got sober, I was pretty sure that it meant sobriety meant getting a white picket fence, a nine-to-five job, and your life is over. And I still went for it because that was my option. Like I was like, I'm either going to fucking die or I'm going to do this, and, and nothing is going to get in my way. Even my passion, even my artistic integrity, all my shit that I love, nothing was more important, and that was the only way it was going to work for me. And that's funny because at the end, I, 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 I found out I was going to go to rehab and like had a you know, moment of clarity on April 21st, right? And then April 23rd, I was supposed to do a showcase in Philly for the newest comics. And the top 20 in the area were being asked to come. And I was already planning to go to rehab that Wednesday. And I talked myself out of going that Monday. I'm not saying I thought I was going to win, but I was afraid I was going to win. Because I was afraid if I won, I would talk myself out of rehab. Like, look what I just did with drugs. And I didn't even show up. I didn't even call them. Like, sorry, Philly Punchline. But, like, you know, I just no call, no showed it. Because I was so afraid of my disease at that point that it, I could go at any point if I don't take the right steps and just leave on this plane to L.A. on Wednesday like I have scheduled. Yeah. So, like, I get that. At the end, it's like, no, 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 I need to do this over any of my art. If it suffers, if I never do stand up ever again, yeah. so be it because I am tired of living this way. Now, when did you get into, like, was it drinking first or was it drugs first? Man, if I could only remember. <laughs> but I did have access to alcohol when I was really young. My parents are European, and it was totally fine to drink. You know, it was fine to drink with dinner. It was fine. I had this stuff called Advocar, which is like a British liqueur when I was real little. I had amaretto on my ice cream. I hear that there was whiskey in my milk when I was a baby to, like, be soothing or whiskey on my gums. You were in Greece, right? I was in England and Greece. Like, my parents, my mom was from England and my dad was Greek they met in New York but they were constantly going home and and so I was exposed to the culture of like you know alcohol was pretty normal and um, I believe that was probably the first thing but you know that and sugar like I was a sugar junkie from day one it was yeah. pretty out of control with that yeah and then event, when did it become like a habit for you then like because I was like I think 12 when it became like if you have you ever looked back and go when was I drinking to medicate as opposed to drinking to have fun or because it was something to do yeah well i mean i think it was always like a soothing thing that i would do for myself and when i was little like i remember going up on the roof in new york we, we you know i would go sit on the roof and i would take with me like the the cures i would take cigarettes i would take cool whip and i would like i would go sit on the roof and it would be like my time to like feel good and uh and that was uh that was my thing that, 
What part of the city did you grow up in? I mean, we were all over the place. We were, uh, when I was real little, like, I guess we were in, like, Astoria. Then we were in Westchester, okay. like, Pelham area. The Burbs. Yeah, 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 like, right outside the Bronx, though. So it was pretty, like, you know. And then when I was on my own, I lived in the Lower East Side and, and um, mostly that area. Kind of, kind of, like, Little Italy, Chinatown border. Um, when did yeah. you get into painting, then? I got into painting more in the Bronx because, like, when I was younger, that's we were just close to there. And under I ninety five, we used to paint, and and I met up with these guys. Like they wrote, I mean, it was BTC was their crew, and they were in the Bronx, and that's who I really did graffiti with. I uh, I did start more as a vandal than an artist, you mm -hmm. know. So it wasn't like oh I'm gonna be an artist. Like it was like I just want something to do, and I would run around and. I ended up being getting good at the spray paint just through doing it over and over and then like oh what if I try to do this other thing you know like what if I try to do a character what if I try to do my letter like this like you know just experimenting and um and it grew from from that really my art now, did did anyone like take you like because I, I know at least you know I always like followed other comedians and like had people to look up to and be like hey how did you do this? How did you write this? And uh, I would always have like questions that would bounce off like one person. Did you have anybody that was like helping you along at all that was like looking over you? Well, when I, well, you know, first it was like the guys in the crew. There was a guy in, when I was young, my, my parents sent me to Greece. Like when I was, I was getting in trouble for writing on stuff when I was like 13. And I was not doing well in school. And my dad's answer was like, send me to the island where he grew up. Yeah. And on the island, I met up with more people who did graffiti. <laughs> and those kids, like, you know, kind of, um, it just went full force, you know. And then, uh, yeah, and then when I came back to the U.S. when I was a teenager, like, I was painting on a rooftop in the Bronx. And, and someone who I had seen in books, like, approached me, actually, Lady Pink. And... Um, she ended up taking me on as an apprentice and it really changed things for me, you know, in, in terms of the art. And unfortunately, I did let her down with the drug. Like, I was being kind of shady about my drug use. Like, it had evolved into hard drugs at the time. And, you know, I I can definitely, um, I did, you know, end up making amends to her because I put a lot of people in a bad position with, with what I was doing. And I had a great opportunity. And I showed up for my opportunity, but I was doing some shady stuff behind the scenes. And when I did, like, fall and get hospitalized and almost die, uh, there, there was a lot of people who were kind of traumatized from that. Yeah, because they don't know that you're on drugs. They just think you're getting hurt on the job, and they, you know, were up, they could have been up there with you. And, yeah, that's a traumatizing for anybody. What, what do you mean you fell? Like? No, I meant fall, like, physically, <coughs> health-wise. Oh, okay. health okay. You know, because I had... You're always up on lifts doing crazy shit. No, no, shit. I didn't fall. <laughs> I didn't fall off the lift or anything. I'm actually, you know, no matter what, like, hanging on for dear life. Yeah. But uh, I would have these health issues, like, with my lungs and, like, with the other things that, you know, I would end up in the hospital. I was in a coma when I was, like, 21 or, 21 or 22. Like, I, I was in a pretty bad state, and nobody knew what what happened did they, you know? was it a, that where they put you into the coma or did you end up in a coma they accidentally an... OD'd me because they hit me with a sedative when I was getting intubated and um it, yeah so it, it caused an OD because they didn't know it was an opiates I obviously wasn't forthcoming who was with me wasn't forthcoming and uh and I ended up under for a while longer than they thought I should have been and they were gonna, um, you know, it was pretty bad. I had to learn how to walk again. When you're under that long, like you have, to, your muscles atrophy. And I had to go to physical therapy, you know, like I was inpatient in a re physical rehabilitation, not drug related rehabilitation, because it was never addressed. And my feeling, like I was on state medical at the time. Uh, I think they call it Medicaid in New York. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was on Medicaid, so I didn't I didn't know as a young kid, you know, I was like twenty something, like I said, twenty one, twenty two, and I was afraid to say anything about the drugs because I didn't want them to cut 
what I thought they might take away my health insurance. Yeah. So I was just like, no, no, I tried weed once at a party. That's all I've ever done. Like, blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't know if anything's in my system. You put it there. Like, you know, like, yeah, and this was the '90s, so right. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was the early 2000s. Okay. You know, I think it was like 2001. I forget the exact time. Was that after 9/11, or is that before 9/11 when you got? I think it was a little after. Okay. Yeah, I think it was a little after. Um, yeah, but you know, 9/11 definitely supercharged my drug use because I I had kind of like started to steer away from heart or tried to steer away. You know, when you try to catch yeah. yourself. And you're like, this is, like, not good. Yeah. I don't want to do this shit. And except that I was hanging out with all junkies. And I was like, we're all not going to do this shit anymore. Yeah. And then, like, I remember specifically, like, when the plane hit. Because I woke up and I was like, I woke up from, I heard it hit. I, I was going to just, I was literally going to, I was yeah. like, I was like, my first day of high school, my first day ever was 9-11, 2001. Oh, wow. So, like, yeah. I remember my first day of high school, you know. Yeah. So, like. You were getting high then, so, like, can you take me through? Like, I can't imagine... Well, I was trying to not get high. I was like, we're not going to do hard drugs. Okay. Whoever was in the apartment, I lived down there. <laughs> and um, fucking wake up with the bang, and I see everybody's awake. And I'm like, the fuck are you doing? We're supposed to be not... And they were up all night doing fucking coke and whatever. And I was like, we're going to not do hard drugs. What the fuck's happening? They're like, a plane hit the tower. I don't give a fuck about a plane hit the tower. Y'all, like, lied and blah, blah, blah. And then we all go up to the rooftop... Because you don't think when you hear a plane hit a tower... Like some idiot was driving a the, little tourist thing and hit the plane. Whatever. Yeah. Fuck up, you know? And then uh, we went upstairs and we're watching the smoke and, and the From hole. the roof? Yeah, it was in the roof. I lived on Elizabeth and Broom then. And um, another plane came. And, uh, and that was when... It. Yeah, I saw the second plane hit. And... Uh, and that was when we knew there was a problem. And that was also, like, when New York just kind of lost its shit. Like, everybody, you know, we watched the towers fall. And then where I lived became cordoned off. Like, no one could come down there unless you had an ID that said you lived down below Houston. And um, there was no cops. And there was no cars in the streets because nobody was allowed down there. And to be honest with you, it's horrible... I mean, I'm not even going to get into how traumatizing it was to watch that whole thing go down, as everyone who had to see it, both on TV and in real life, knows. But what happened afterwards in the streets of New York was something where we all were just partying. Like, it was just, like, smoking blunts in the street, but You think you, in you the could street. die at any point. You, all, you just survived. I was like, fuck it. Like, we're doing drugs. Talk like, about the fuck it's... I mean, because, like, you just you just saw all that. Like, yeah. why wouldn't you? And the cops, no one's watching you. It was like a, it was the only way to self-soothe at the time. And everybody was coming together and it felt like free. And it felt like it don't matter anymore. And why am I even bothering? And oh, I just yeah. been watching people jump and die. Like, why the hell would I not just get high? And it was a four-year run for me after that. Okay, so that and that was even including the hospital stay yeah. shortly after. Yeah, the day after I got out of the hospital, I got high. I wasn't planning on it. I was in the hospital in the ICU and the regular hospital for about two months, and then I was in two months of physical rehabilitation. Pretty sure that I was not going to be using after that. And the day that I got home, I found some shit that was just sitting there. Leftover? It wasn't mine. It was my, my homies who mm -hmm. was said he also quit but did not quit you know yeah and i was like oh so you have shit so i'm taking it just to prove a point and now i'm gonna do some and that was it and that you took know. you yeah i mean that's all it takes it i could still barely walk while i was still relapsing i remember because we went to the beach and i was like i can't walk on the sand because my muscles weren't that good yeah. And I was already getting high. Because you were still atrophied, right? You were, oh, like, yeah. I was still, building like... it back. Like, it was one of those things where you couldn't step into... You had to, like, practice to step into a bathtub. You know? But, um... So what ended that four-year run for you? What happened... You know, that was when, um... You know, I was trying to stop. I you were would, painting the whole entire time, right? I painted to support my addiction. Okay. Which is why I think I'm such a flexible painter. Like, I meet artists that are like, I paint my shit. This is what I like to do. And I was like, whatever you want. Whatever, As long as you're going to pay me? Pay I'll, me? I'll fucking paint it. So when's the first time you got, like, 
paid for painting? Like, I know, like... Well, when... honestly, the first person who paid me was my mentor, Lady Pink. Okay. She hired me when, that when I told you mm -hmm. I met her on the rooftop. Like, we painted for fun, and then she hired me to come with her to work and be her assistant. She was the first person. She paid me $100 a day. And I was like, whoa, you know, whoa, a hundred dollars? Like, I was used to getting, like, arrested. And um, not only that, to, to paint with my idol, like, you know? So she's the first person who paid me. And then what happened during my addiction is, like, I would paint whatever the fuck, you know? Like, and um, I did a lot of restaurants, and I did a lot of copies. I copied everybody's shit, you know? Like, and that's kind of shady, I guess, in a way, but, like... I think it's more practicing, I, think I it's practiced, but practice I like practiced lines. for, you know, it helped me, yeah. like, 100%. And, you know, I did stuff like when the Van Gogh show came to the Met, it was a big Van Gogh show at the Met, and I lived in Little Italy at the time, and I collected all the cigar boxes. There was little cigar shops down there, and uh, they used to leave these wooden boxes outside after, and uh, I collected them all, and I would go to the Met, and I would copy different Van Goghs onto the boxes, and I would sit on those steps outside the Met, and I sold those boxes for fifty dollars each, That's and that right. was a cash cow, man. Yeah, like it was like money, easy money for me, and um, and then that that supported my addiction, and then yeah, all the restaurant stuff I did, you know, I was uh, up until this sobriety, I was using, you know, in uh, in the bathroom, I was like shooting speed balls and and painting painting, going to work. Like I work on when I'm on drugs, I work like I. And I drink, and I, I do hard drugs, and I still get my job done. And, like, that was why it was so hard for me to see that there was a problem. That was, you know, I, and for me it was, I was okay with the problem. Mm -hmm. I, I, it helped me function, right? Like, I went for 10 years with pills, basically, where I was working the entire time, where most people didn't know anything you know, because I wasn't, like, emaciated. We talked about it. You know, I was gaining weight. I was, like, a Chris Farley on opiates. I was yeah. retaining all the water, and I was gaining weight. So, you know, I was just somebody that was quiet because I was I was afraid, always afraid to talk because I was always high, yeah. you know. And when I did talk, it was because I was really high, you know. Um, so wh where did Muck Rock come from? When was the first time you tagged Muck Rock? I mean, honestly, That you like, can remember because, obviously, you know. <laughs> like... I was always muck. I was mucky pup when I was younger. <coughs> mucky pup came from my grandma in England. She used to call me mucky pup. That's a British term. Kind of like a sloppy whatever. A uh, little kid. And, and I wrote that and then I shortened to muck. And then, you know, when I was trying to legitimize myself, like I just used my real first name, like Jules, and, and then muck. And then... Um, yeah, you know, it's funny, I have, I have a muck rock and then I have a Jules muck. Yeah, I you know? signed both of them. I like, the do. rock comes from, like, it's like kind of like an old graffiti term. Like, a lot of people use it. Like, they'll put, like, you know, so-and-so rock. Okay. Like, it was a hip-hop graffiti term that, like, just kind of naturally was good for me to use. And then when, like, the internet stuff started to happen, it became an easy way for people to find me instead of just muck. Because if you put in muck, you're going to get, like boot company and like yeah you know, mud whatever. so what led you to your first like 2005 like i gotta get clean or i'm gonna die kind of thing in 2005 i had been trying to get clean i've been trying to get clean like the whole time i was using like i was always like i'm gonna kick on monday i would well, I mean, what's, what was the break there's always a breaking point yeah now. well i was on i i was doing a thing i had gotten to this island i went back to the island i went to the island that my dad sent me to and um i went there and I had a pretty gnarly bottom, like a lot of shit went down. And um, I mean, at the time I had traveled there with some, I had two needles left, you know. One of the needles had no suction and one of the needles had no point. So like I was dirty ass old needles shooting dirty ass heroin and, and cocaine. And because I had gone to kick, of course I kicked and then I had immediately found drugs. And then I was wrapped up in the world of um, doing these drugs in a very difficult um, place to get drugs. So it was a lot, it was, I just made my life more difficult, basically. Yeah, you're on yeah, a freaking island I in could, Europe. <laughs> it was freaking hard, and I didn't want anyone to know, so I wasn't about to go to the pharmacy and buy needles. So I was piggybacking the one with the suction into the one with the point, and I was trying to bang, like, and I was doing 
At the time that I bottomed out, I actually had ran out of heroin because there was a five-day waiting period to get heroin. <coughs> on island. So you had to pay for it, mm -hmm. and then you had to wait. So I had paid for it, and I had cocaine, and I hate cocaine, but I was doing it. So I was shooting coke with a broken needle, which meant that I couldn't register. So I don't know if anyone knows anything about shooting coke, but like if you miss with cocaine, when you don't, when you don't have it in your vein and you miss, you get this lump that's incredibly painful. It doesn't dissolve like heroin. So uh, I was covered in these lumps. I was uh, unable to see if it was in the vein because I couldn't pull back. I couldn't register. I was like, is it in the vein? I don't think so. I pull it out. It was in the vein. There's blood going everywhere. So I'm in this fucking room. There's blood splatter everywhere. There's bumps all over me. I can't bend my arm. I think I punctured an artery. Everything's fucked up. And, um, and I found out that my friend that was on his way to meet me, Dylan, had left LA, he had gone from New York to LA to get his passport, and he was supposed to be coming back to New York to fly to Greece to help me, and he was shooting cocaine on the Greyhound, and his heart exploded, and he died. And I got the email, and I was shooting cocaine, and I had a moment of realization at that time, and this, I was like, you know, I was just sitting there covered in blood, unable to bend my arms, and I saw his face kind of floating, and he used to always say to me the same thing. And he fucked with recovery way before I fucked with recovery. But, like, I just was trying to do, not do hard drugs was what was my mindset, yeah. you know? Yeah. But, like, I saw his face and he was just like, you're never going to stop. And that's what he used to say to me all the time. But what occurred to me when he said that was, like, you. You're never going to stop. And I was like, I can't do this. I fucking can't do it alone. And that was the first time that it occurred to me that I might need help. Because I was always like, it's a fucking, I just stop doing it. That's the thing, right? You just stop doing the thing. Like, stop shooting drugs. What's the problem? You know it's bad. You decide not to do it, and you stop doing it. Where does this not add up? But when, he, when I had that realization that I can't fucking stop, that was when I asked for help. And that was what made a turning point for me. And reaching out to most random people that I reached out to, like childhood friends, you know, weird shit. Is it people that you knew that you used to get high with that you knew that no, weren't getting high? No, I'm talking about people that I knew when I was two years old, five years old. Oh, shit. It was weird. Well, and, you were in uh, Greece, right? I was in Greece. So that makes sense, though. So. No, but uh, yeah, I reached out to people and I was advised to go to rehab and I was advised to tell my dad. And I did those things and, I, and it was a long journey. It was, I was in, uh, you know, I was on the other side of the world. And, um... I ended up at a place after, but, but, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles. Like, on a, a boat. I was on a boat. I was on a deck of a boat. I was in a cab. I was in a fucking airplane. I was in another cab. And I ended up at this place uh, called White Deer Run at Blue Mountain. And I'm so sad that it's not there anymore. It's right near here. There, there is actually, yeah, there is a bunch of White Deer Runs. So, and we're supposed to be hearing from one because they want to partner with us for our meeting center. Wow, that's um, amazing. They're really good people. Yeah. Very good people. The yeah. one I was called was White Deer Run at Blue Mountain, and I don't think it exists anymore. And it was very cool. And they had, you know, it was a small mom and pop kind of little place, but they had a lot of people there that were, like, trying to do their thing instead of jail. So it was low-key. It wasn't one of these bougie places. It was very 12-step based. And, um, and it helped me, like, introduced me to recovery. Yeah. I also was completely dysfunctional and unable to listen to rules, and I violated all their contracts, and I ended up getting kicked out. I mean, there was a lot of shit that happened. I had, I had almost, I think I had 26 days or something when I got kicked out, which okay. was good. Your insurance would have kicked you out of 28 anyway. Probably. I mean, it wasn't insurance. I paid cash with them. I was making money. When I went into oh, rehab, I was okay. pulling wads of euros out of my pockets. No shit. Like, I never have a problem making money when I'm getting high. Like, I work my ass off. So, like, I, I paid cash for my rehab, you know? Yeah. Like, it was uh, it was only, like, $3,000. It was a legitimate rehab. Uh, like these motherfuckers. Where they're trying to take your money. Grand. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I mean, not, I'm not down for any of that. I can't believe <coughs> that shit. They're, they're still big. calling me. The, the rehab I went to in Culver City is still calling me, and they're owned by new people. And there's, and my, the old people said, oh, no, you're good. You know, don't worry about it. Like, you went to high society or high sobriety, so, like, you paid us cash already, don't worry about it, we'll forgive it, and now I'm getting all these phone calls all of a sudden, now that there's new ownership, I'm like, listen, please stop calling me, you guys got so much money from us, like, I'm doing great, please stop trying to trigger me with some dumb shit, like, I'm doing good, like, I don't want to go back there, like, I talk about how amazing you guys are all the time, 
I don't want to have to change that, you know, just because you guys are bill collectors now, you know, but like the program itself was amazing. It was a 12-step one and it introduced me to the program. Yeah. You know, without that, you know, they, they, they trick you into meetings and the one I went to in Culver City because the only time we left the house, because in LA rehabs are basically houses, let's be real, like they're hiding in plain sight. And the only time we ever got to leave was go to a meeting. We went to the Nooners at Marina and 26 and Broad every day, depending on how much time we had, and we went to an 8 o'clock every night. And that's where I met you. That's where I saw you speak for the first time. And I was like, holy shit, like, I want what she has. Like, I want to hear more, and I want to be her friend. Like, we didn't have cell phones, you know. So I was like, muck rock, muck rock, muck rock. <laughs> and I went back to the rehab, and I wrote it down, like, find muck rock on Instagram when you have phone privileges. Yeah. <laughs> because she only had a phone once in a while. But I was, yeah, and then we eventually became friends, and we'll catch up to that. Um, so, when you get out of the 12-step, now, what were you doing in White Deer Run when they kicked you out? Well, I, like I said, I violated their whatever contract a few times. I got written up. Um, one thing was kind of crazy, though. Um, they took us out to a federal park, and I had a marker, and I caught a lot of tags. I was very stupid because I was known in the rehab as Muck. I used to be called Muck by everybody, and nobody knew like really my first name, and before even Jules Muck, whatever. I was just Muck, and in the rehab I was Muck, and I wrote Muck all over the federal park. Were you and antsy just to do it because you hadn't? It was a high. Okay, yeah. It's always a high, you know, yeah. and that was my only outlet, and that was what I did. And um, at the time, they were battling with me about the art anyway, because I was checking out with art one hundred percent. Like I was sketching during the groups. They took my pencils away. I was carving people's faces out of the dirt. Like, I was doing anything to check out. Like, which, it was a coping mechanism, and it got me through it, but it also, they thought it was not good. So, anyway, when I caught tags all over the federal park, there was a problem. And I've seen you still do that, too. When we used to do the yard, when you first started the yard, and we would hang out there on the Saturday nights and do the meetings, there were some nights that you were, like, sitting, you were right up in, and then there's some nights I could tell, like, you had to be somewhere else. And yeah. you would just be sketching in your notepad. Not even something I would ever see you work on. Never even see you paint. I just see you sketching something. Yeah. And I would always like, okay, Jules is like, you know, in it. She's like, gotta do that. Yeah, That's how I mean, she concentrates. I have like ADD, you know. But also, yeah. I think at that point, I was just trying to get high. I wanted a brush, and I did it. They called me out. It was a big deal at the fucking rehab. The directors were there, and they were like, listen, we're going to call the cops on you. You know what happens when you get arrested in Pennsylvania? They're talking about they're going to hose me down naked, like all this crazy shit that happens. And I was like, oh my God, they're about to call the feds. It was a federal park. And um, and instead they say, you know, look, give us the marker, blah, blah, blah. I was trying to withhold. I gave them the marker. And they were like, okay, so you did it. So instead of calling the feds, we're going to um, let the other residents of the rehab decide your punishment. And, um, and for them, they're going to lose all their privileges. They can't go out anymore. There'll be no trips. There's no outside meetings. Everybody's stuck here, and you're to blame. Now, we're going to ask them, what should be your punishment? And I thought for sure they are going to kick me out, like they're all losing all their privileges because of me. And the people, the residents, the other drug addicts, they got together, and they said, okay, we know what it is. We want her to guess who has the ball every day. And they had a little bouncy ball. And the directors were so pissed and the counselors were so pissed. Everybody was like, that's your punishment? And that was when it clicked up for me that these are my people. <laughs> yeah. These addicts and alcoholics are on my side. Like, we stick together. And that's how I got sober. And that was the turning point for me. If I learned anything from rehab, the most important thing I learned was in that moment when I realized that these were the people that had my back. And it wasn't about the counselors and it wasn't about the directors. It wasn't about the therapy. It wasn't about anything but the other addicts and alcoholics. And we bonded at that moment. I began to trust them. And even though I violated again for like cutting my hair or some shit and getting scissors and they kicked me out, like I had already formed a bond with the people of Alcoholics Anonymous and the other addicts in recovery so that when I got kicked out, the first place I went was AA. I lived in a sober living and I poured myself into the program and my first higher power was my fellows. That's awesome. Yeah, because I feel like whenever they not get your back, I always say that, you know, get sober, it's fine because we're all the same people that we were at the bar. Like, if you were like, I, I was a bar drinker a lot before I got into pills, you know, I was at the bars a lot. 
And um, so, and I was like, we're the same people, except we don't have a drink in front of us. We'll have a coffee in front of us. But we're still the same attitude. We're still the same friend. We're still the same, you know, we can still get along. Just, we just don't have alcohol in front of us. But besides that, we're still the same. So that's funny that that's, you realize that in that moment, like, oh, these are just the same people that I would just get high with, but now we're just going to do other things instead. Yeah, and we're clinging on to each other like a life raft, you know? Like, we don't get sober alone. And I tried for a long time to get sober alone. Yeah. I tried to quit for a long time, but the only way it works for me now is, like, with other people. Oh, for sure. And that group thing is magic in it. When did you leave Pennsylvania then? How long did you hang around, like, in sober living and stuff? Oh, no, I didn't go to sober living yet. (coughs) What happened was, as I I got kicked out... um, I got a phone call. My brother picked me up, actually, and I thought I was going to go back to New York and, like, back to the apartment, like, mm-hmm. Lori's side, whatever, you know. And then um, I got a phone call from one of the people that I had called early on. I forget. This girl I knew from when I was a kid, and she happened to be come through sobriety, and she had been in rehab with a guy uh, named Dave Bue, and when she was in rehab with him... He was starting, uh, he got out of rehab and started a sober living. And it was very ghetto. Like, this guy, like, it was like, you know, someone with four years sober started a sober living. Yeah. It wasn't exactly established. He rented a house in New Haven, Connecticut, in the ghetto. And uh, and he was renting him out, rooms, beds, beds for $400. And she said, you should go there. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? And there wasn't even a bed. It was like, you should go there and sleep on the couch. And I was like, oh, God. You know, but I went, you know, because something that I heard in rehab was like, you take suggestions. Yeah. And I took the suggestion. And I ended up in New Haven, Connecticut. Now, I'll be honest with you. I stayed in New Haven, Connecticut for three years. I fucking loved it. I, I bonded with the recovery there, the people there. I fell completely into the AA program. I mean, the sober living at the time went to shit. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say... Dave pulled it together afterwards, and he has one of the biggest conglomerate, like, rehab sober livings in the world now. That's awesome. Turnbridge. I mean, he pulled it together. He made a beautiful facilities all over the, that area. But at the time, this was not functional. Everybody relapsed. The manager relapsed. I stayed sober. And I remember when he came over, and he was like, who's, who's, uh, who's high? And I was like, everybody's high. Everybody's fucking high. But I didn't mind. I was going to meetings. I had my dog in the house. I was doing breaking all the rules. I had no curfew. Everybody was high. You know, yeah. but I stayed sober by going to meetings, not from the regimented facility. Yeah. You know, I went to the meetings every, all day. I used to tell people, like, I'm either at a meeting, on my way to a meeting, or walking back from a meeting all day. Yeah. Like, that's all I'm doing. That was doing. me when we met. You yeah. know, I was in three, four, five. You were like, how many did you hit today? I'm like, four. Like, yeah. I did like 20 in one weekend because LA, there's like 300 a week or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, now, I've seen people go, oh, my God, everyone's relapsing. That means I'm going to relapse. I might as well relapse. But I always was like, okay, they're all relapsing, so my odds of making it are much higher now. So, every time I saw somebody go out, I'm like... All right, my chances of making it will just crept up a little bit. Did you ever feel like that? Like, okay, they're all going, but that gives me more strength. Like, you draw strength from that? I mean, not really strength. I mean... Confidence? It just made me hang on, like, do more. Okay. You know, like, I've always been like, fuck, like, I see what people don't do. That's the first thing I ask people, like, when they're coming back or when they realize, I'm like, what the fuck happened? Like, I'm scared. (coughs) I know I could go out at any minute. I try to do as much as I possibly can. To this day, you know, I normally hit a meeting every day. I'm like eight years in this round. And like, I, I uh, you know, I'm, I make a meeting if they're, if, if I, you know, or, you know, I make something happen. When did you leave New Haven and end up in LA? So, when I was, I guess I was three or four years sober. And um, I started thinking about leaving New Haven. Like 08, 09. I think it was, yeah, I think it was like 08, maybe. I was like fucking bored, you know? Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm bored. Well, it's New Haven. I mean, it's fun for... Yeah, and I went through a bunch of stuff there, and it was good, but like, I was like, I, I felt like I needed to grow, you know? And my sponsor told me, she was like, don't leave till it's good. That's what she told me. And then one day, like, I, I got my free coffee. I used to get free coffee at every coffee shop. Everybody loved me. I had graffiti up. I did a big... And I was painting live somewhere on the, you know, in the town center, and like, uh, and watching you paint live is just like, cause um, like yeah. we've been friends for years and I've been seeing you on Instagram painting for years, but like, you know, I've seen you do tattoos, you know, I've seen you draw, but 
never seen to paint walls like we did, you know, yesterday. Like, we get those five walls in, like, ten and a half hours. Yeah, I mean, and, well, this time I was painting, and um, I was trying to beat the rain. The rain was coming, I was finishing my piece, and I didn't realize everybody else in the whole thing had stopped painting. And so everybody was gathered around me, this crowd. And I finished the piece right before the rain broke, and I turned around, and it was a standing ovation of everyone clapping. And I knew in that moment, I was like, time to go. You know, and I uh, I made the decision to move to California because a friend of mine. This episode is sponsored by MJ's Progress Not Perfection Meeting Center Association. The name sounds familiar because it is where my podcast studio is held. We are in our meeting center where we do all these meetings for mental health and addiction. And since we can't get any of the local businesses to sponsor what we do here, I figure I'll sponsor the podcast. I can do this podcast anywhere. I can do this at home. I can do this in a closet somewhere. I can do this in a basement somewhere. It doesn't matter. All I need is somebody else to talk to about addiction and recovery, and I can do this podcast. What I can't do from anywhere is help people with their addiction and their mental health problems. You know, we've had a lot of amazing success stories that keep me so filled with gratitude that I do this. We're here all day long running meetings all day long because we want to help as many people as we can. And even when we help one, that's the biggest victory in the world. And that's how I feel right now. So if you can help out what we do here, then that would be amazing. You know, we do have a Venmo, we have a Cash App, we have a PayPal, we have an address you can send a check to. And, you know, all the money that gets donated goes towards rent, goes towards keeping the lights on. If you are a local business, if you're a national business, whatever, and you want to be a part of what we're doing, you know, you can reach out to me and we can talk about how you can be a sponsor. We had a place. She was like, you should come to California. I got this house. I mean, when I got here, when I got to California, she did kick me out. She was a little crazy. I did trust the wrong person. But because I was sober, I didn't I actually ended up homeless, you know, but it wasn't a bad way. I used to go to meetings. I would go to meetings and I'd be like, Dude, I love this shit. I'm painting all day. I have designer coffee. Like, everything is fine. I didn't have enough money for a deposit right away, but I ended up having an art show at a cafe that because I was sober and I showed up and I talked to people while I was on the street, I was painting on the street on these canvases and I met so many people when I had the art show. I sold more paintings at that art show than I've ever sold in my life. Like, and the amount of money was high. I went and got an apartment the next day. Talk about being able to find meetings easily, you know what I mean, in a place like you found your, at least... You trusted the wrong person, but that wrong person brought you to a place that one, you're not you're not racing against the rain as much. Let's yeah. be real. And and two, like you get to go to so many meetings when you're homeless, like but actually want to be there and not just going for the free coffee homeless. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the, some in the marina, like you see, like they're there and they're smoking meth in the bathroom. You know, but like you're you're homeless but like you're not you're probably going to four meetings a day and painting all in between yeah and people took care of me like yeah. i i mean most of the time i slept at people's places or like you know i was always welcome everyone like provided for me in the rooms and were you always on the west side yeah i i went i think i rented a room for a little bit in the mid middle like mid city downtown mid city not all the way downtown i mean i did move i moved to echo park at one point too but that was later on but it was like for a month i've, I've always been like if you're in california like by the beach yeah right? why is, yeah i mean especially new haven was the other beach yeah i'm you know? coastal i like to be coastal for sure yeah i mean new york you're right you're not, you're not far from brooklyn you can get over to the beach pretty quick like, yeah, you know, I like to stay near the waters. Yeah, even and if Greece, I'm not, shit. Yeah. You, I mean, Greece and I'm then an island person. England. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you really are. And you put two yeah. and two together, because then you ended up in Venice, right? Um, did you? And you bought that property still in your first sobriety? No, I don't. I don't own the Venice property. Okay, but you yeah. still you got that. When did you move there? Um, that was in um, 2010. Okay. Yeah, and I actually thought I was sober. And it was my beginning of my going out, which I didn't realize. I was just going to ask you, yeah. like, what was your... Because I always ask everybody, too, when they have, like, relapse. Like, what was your relapse well, like? Well, what happened was I had moved to Echo Park, like I said, for a month. But I didn't ever go to any meetings out there. I didn't go to any meetings. And, um, and I got depressed. And I was not having trouble. I was having a lot of trouble finishing paintings, which was weird. But, like, I couldn't finish anything. And I started going to a doctor. And the doctor prescribed me speed, basically. They call it Adderall, but, you know, it's amphetamines. Yeah. And, um, and I decided to ignore the fact that I knew. 
and my brain tricked me. And I knew, like I'll tell people all day, well, I wasn't a pill head. I had no idea about pills. But like, I do remember when I'm think clearly and honestly at White Deer Run Blue Mountain, there was a guy named Brad that we called Bradderall because his drug of choice was Adderall. And I sat there and I took the prescription for Adderall. And I was like, I don't like uppers. Like, it's not gonna be a problem for me. And, um, and it became a huge problem. And it was a slow progression. So I got that house in Venice and I turned it into a crack house, basically. Like I moved in so many homeless people. I was up all night. Like by the end, it was like we were bondoing cars. I was into body work on cars. Like it, it was like, you know, I had a lot of people living in tents outside the house. I had seven people living in a one bedroom house. I was very busy all the time. I was very aggro, smoked a lot. You know, um, Venice was a lot different, you know, 12 years, 11 years ago, wasn't it? I mean, Venice was not gentrified. It yet. was turning. It was yeah. starting to turn. OK. And I was like, kind of just I was checked out, you know, um, and I can't believe I didn't lose the house, to be honest. Like, yeah. I still, you know, like you like I assumed you owned it because I'm surprised you didn't lose it. Cause I, I my knew landlord a little bit. is a saint like the shit she put up with. And one time we got 20 code violations from the city. Like, and, um, I was very motivated in my addiction. Like I cleaned that shit up like three day notice, get everything out of the yard. And I, I did it with all the homeless people helping me, but I did a lot of crazy stuff. Like i like had a, I had my first solo ex exhibition in LA at that time. And instead of putting up paintings, I decided to have homeless people build a house inside the gallery out of garbage. And that was something that I did. It's called Muck This House. And it was like, uh, the gallerist was like, what the fuck? You know? Yeah, like, like, this isn't what we paid for. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, people don't need art. They need housing. Mm -hmm. You know? And all these, ho I thought I was like half there with my ideas. But then I was like, oh, and I'm going to help all these homeless people also get sober. Because at the same time, I thought I was sober on all these pills. So I'd round up all the tweakers. And I'd be like, we're going to the doctor. We're going to get on Adderall. I got everybody's prescriptions. I doled out vitamin A in the morning. We bondoed cars. I used to have a $400 a week sandpaper habit because we were sanding the cars down. You know, like, that's what I, I mean, that's what we did. Like, we would fucking bondo cars. I don't know what that is. Well, when you have a dent in a car, this is what I learned how to do it, is you drill into the dent, mm -hmm. you pop it out, and you bondo the hole. Oh, okay. So, bondo smells terrible, the whole street smelled like it, and we would sand it with these sandpaper, you know, machines, mm -hmm. whatever. Fucking. So that's what you heard all night long, and that was what I was spending my time doing. I was painting too, but um, it was really crazy times. I was selling garbage. I would collect garbage around, and I would sell. I was very tweakery. My whole house was like my yard was a constant yard sale. And that was for a couple of years. Yeah, I think I was out from like two thousand. I think I went out two thousand ten to like two thousand thirteen. What happened was I still had a career going. Like at one point, I had a kind of a weird bottom in San Francisco. I was up in San Francisco painting and. Um, I was on my way back from San Francisco and I was, I was running out of my pills. At that point I was prescribed Adderall, Xanax and Oxy. And, um, it was so easy to get. It was very easy. And yeah. I was running out of the Oxy and, um, I was kind of freaking out, you know, and I like started hitting people up on the, you were speedballing basically. Yeah. And I was on uh, Craigslist was where we used to buy extra pills, you know, just till I saw the doctor. Yeah. That was my feeling. And I still thought I was sober. It was so crazy, like so bizarre. And I remember like talking to this guy through the internet, like through the Craigslist, and he was like, I'm here. Like, and I was on the 405, and then I was trying to cross through the National Forest to get to Santa Maria. I ended up in Ojai, and I was trying to connect with this guy who was trying to, I thought I was buying oxys, and then get to Ojai, and he's like, it's black, you know, which means it's tar. And I was just like, it's fine, I'm just, it's whatever. I don't fucking care, you know, at this point. And he was like, I don't remember exactly where I was when he was like, yeah, I have seven months sober. I'm just trying to get rid of this. I'm out of the game. And I was like, oh, shit. I, I want to be sober. I thought I was sober. I'm not sober. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And, so um, you thought you're like, I have eight years sobriety when really you're out for three years. And I've been out, yeah. And I was like, I want to be sober to this guy on the phone. And he was like, well, don't come meet me then. And then he became my sponsor. This guy, Stevie. You fucking cracked me up. Yeah, he was like, he was like, I'll sponsor you. Go home. What What do you have left? I was like, I have this many Xanax, this much Adderall. He's like, throw away the Adderall. Use the Xanax to kick the fucking oxys because I'd already ran out of that. And um, 
And I did it, and I started going to AA, but I didn't go to that many meetings, and I was kind of relying heavy on this good dude that I never met. We would we would Skype, you know, and he was uh, helping me, and um, about 30 days, I, I couldn't get a hold of him. I had like 30 days sober, I couldn't get a hold of him, and I said, where is this fool, you know? Like, he had been really cool to me, he had been commissioning <coughs> meetings, he, he, we'd never met, but I'd been, you know, he'd mm -hmm. been helping me survive. The kick was pretty gnarly, I came off a lot of shit. To be honest with you, I didn't really understand where the line was between my psych meds and Adderall, Xanax, and Oxy, and I was just like, pills bad, no more. And I stopped everything cold turkey, which sent me into oh a God. gnarly tailspin. So as you, you said know, bipolar. I was on Holy Abilify, Lamictal, like all the shit. So when 30 days hit, the half-life hit, the pills withdrawal from the psych meds fucked me up 10 times more than withdrawal from anything else. Yeah. And I lost my shit. I cut off all my hair to the, to the bone. I wanted to cut my skin off. I was smashing dishes in my front yard because I felt so much rage and uncomfortable and um i didn't understand what was happening but it was a withdrawal from a non-taper just coming off the psych meds like that it was very scary and I, I was losing my shit i couldn't get a hold of my sponsor i looked up i started driving actually i started driving up the coast and i was looking on his facebook like where the fuck how am i gonna find this guy he must be at a meeting or something like i'll try to find him and on his facebook was the directions to his funeral and he had od'd and um, he must have gone out on the shit that he had been trying to sell me. And, uh, and I lost it. I lost it. I was like a mess. And, and that was when um, I really like just lost my shit, basically. And um, I probably would have killed myself at that point, but I smoked weed. I had one hit of weed. And I was like, oh, oh I feel fine. Why have I not been smoking weed this whole time? You know, like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Oh my God, I wasted so much time being an AA. I could have just been smoking weed this whole time. You know, like, so I just smoke weed. And I smoke a little bit of weed. And, and, I, and it was California, so I didn't need a lot. You know, it was one hit. I remember when my friend called me and she was like, you're supposed to help me move. And I was like, honestly, dude, I can't even get up. I had a hit of weed. It's completely different. It was so strong. <laughs> like, I was like, I, it felt like a narcotic. Yeah. But then it became like my coping mechanism. But I was really grateful that I had gotten off the pills. I thought I was doing to medicate, but like, it definitely was increasing, but it was like kind of obviously slower than the hard drugs. And I was still so grateful that I wasn't doing the Adderall that like it felt like a really positive change. And you're still coming off all the all the other meds too, all the psych meds. Yeah, well, that's it, like a long. That's what got me through the come off of the okay. psych meds for sure, like without killing myself. And I will credit it with saving my life at that point. But what happened was because I was doing that, I was no longer relying on my higher power. I was no longer relying on AA. I was kind of like, okay, like I feel like I got this handled, you know. And then I got a, a job to help. I think you know my friend Bender. Yeah. Who I really urge you to have on the podcast because she's an amazing story. Yeah. But Bender was a using buddy from back in the day. And she was like kind of not doing the hard drugs. And she was trying to get her shit together. And she got a big job on the East Coast to do a movie thing. She's in the film business. And she got me hired just so that I would drive with her to get her car there. So she got me hired. So we went cross country. And I swear, like, we were like dumb and dumber. Because the amount, <laughs> well, what somebody told us was like, don't bring fucking flour, you know, we threw. Yeah. Don't bring the plant through Texas. So we got this wax shit that was kind of new then. And I was like, we'll just be safe and we'll wax <laughs> you know, the way through. I, we had these G pens. We each had one so that we wouldn't fight. She still tried to take my shit all the time. But, like, we had all the different waxes. Like, one was for night. One was for day. We immediately mixed them all up with, like, <laughs> token indica. I broke the screen off the freaking G pen because I was like, it's not hitting hard enough. So, basically, we're just smoking wax, you yeah. know? We went backwards for hours at a time. Like, we were doing the wrong way. We'd be like, oh, we've been going the wrong direction. <laughs> we, I guess, so if you ever look on YouTube, if you ever look up Muckbender, we tried to make a movie, and the trailer's up there on YouTube. All right, well, it's going to be at the end of this episode, so yeah. watch the full episode. It's and, pretty bad. Like, the, we're yeah. so fucked up. <laughs> I'm like, definitely going to find it. You're going to laugh your face off. And yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it at the end of the episode. <laughs> so what happened was I ended up going with her. I went on to New York. 
Uh, but that point was just smoking a bunch of weed. Like I was doing, as soon as I got to America, to America as soon as I got to the East Coast, mm -hmm. I was buying fucking vanilla Dutchess, rolling blunts, smoking in the head, fucking drinking at that point, but having an ale, you know, thought I was all good. Went to New York, got a big job to paint the ceiling of a restaurant. You know, everything kind of was like coming together and falling apart at the same time. I, I decided to do my dental work, couldn't get the right pills, hit up my friend Horse. If you have a friend Maybe. named Horse and you ask for painkillers... You're going to get dope. I got some heroin. <laughs> for anyone doesn't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it went down pretty fast. I bottomed out. I was back on the respirator in the hospital within three weeks of shooting heroin. And, oh, um, and like I said, I made that choice after I got kicked out of two hospitals, two ERs, for shooting heroin while I was on a respirator. Um... You would have called I, your friend named Blues. He just would have gave you some pills. I should have called Blues, but I didn't have them. I only had horse. Either way, I was fucked. But, um, yeah, I made that choice in this motel in uh, Pelham Gardens. And, um, and I kicked. And then I remembered the people in New Haven, Connecticut. And I was like, I still had them in my phone. Yeah. Day two of kicking, I drove up to Connecticut, and they took care of me. And they got me into a rehab. They had me kicking on their house, their, the floor, you know, in their houses first. I went to, I actually just was back in Connecticut and I went to the first meeting that I ever went to. And, um, and it was super uncomfortable, man. Like, cause I left Connecticut on a high note. Like I said, standing, oh, everybody loves me, free coffee everywhere, king of whatever the fuck, starting meetings, you know. And I was back as a newcomer who could barely walk or breathe. And it was probably the most important share for me. You know, that humility. That hump, yeah. So grateful for humility because I was um, completely knocked off my high horse and willing to listen and willing to learn. And I've approached this sobriety in a completely different way where I was doing everything. Where before I was like, so like, how can I most be just like what I want to do, you know? Anyway, like I, I've been, like I said, like I put, even though I thought I might not be able to paint anymore, I didn't care. Even though, like, you know, everything that happened, my painting was really bad for the first few months. Like, it didn't really make any sense. And I was already an established artist, so those people there, people happen to be doing not documentaries. I look like an idiot. My paintings look stupid. I didn't, you know, I just kept going. I kept going to AA. And Is I made it. Keep producing? Keep producing was a little later. Okay. <laughs> but, like, I just, um,. I made it back to California. My house was still a trap house. I slept on the couch. Someone oh, because you've been away. away. I had been on the East Coast. And my friend was paying the rent. There was a heroin dealer living in my house when I got home with 30 days sober. There was weed everywhere. There was alcohol everywhere. You could get sober in a crack house. Right? And you're not the kind of person that's going to walk in somewhere and tell everybody to leave. I know how you well, are. Well, they paid the rent. Yeah. I was lucky they let me stay there. I was a guest in my own house. I was sleeping on the couch, you know? You fucking cracked me up. It was crazy. And like I scrounged. I, and like I said, my painting wasn't that functional, so I was making no money. And one day, like, I, I would cry at the AA meetings. I remember collapsing outside the women's meeting. I was a mess. Like, I took my first, I took, oh, man, I can't even tell you. Like, one lady came to my house to help me clean. This girl, Taylor, she was so cool. She helped me clean my house. And, like, we were praying for a solution. And everybody was out. And I opened up an old diary of mine. And there had been a diary that I'd left in the house, so everybody had probably read. You know, it was just sitting on the shelf. Inside the diary was $1,500 in cash, which happened to be the exact rent of the house. It was fucking weird. I don't think they opened it. I don't know where that <laughs> money came from. That's crazy. I don't know if they were stashing the money there. Yeah. I don't know if I left the money there, but I don't really remember doing it. Yeah, maybe that. they were. Maybe maybe that was like next month's rent for them. They're like, well, hide it in her diary because no nobody ever that shit. Nobody ever said anything to me because I took that money and I paid the full rent. Yeah. And then it told everybody at the house. I was like, I have paid the full rent at the house. You guys are welcome to stay as long as you want. Nobody can use drugs or alcohol anywhere on the property. Everybody left. That's awesome. That was an easy way to do it. Like, you can stay, Yeah, you got to do this. But I can't have this shit, you know? Oh, my God. My one friend who had paid the rent, Henry, he was fucking... He went crazy on me. He lost his shit on me because I wouldn't let him roll a joint even. I was like, can you roll that outside? And he was like... He took his big Impala and he drove into the gate. <laughs> he was so bad. No wonder you needed that new fence when we I said... We needed a new fence. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's funny because, like, three years later, he ended up getting sober at the house. But we didn't talk for a while, you know? And the house, as you know, has been sober since then. Same time, you know, we have about the same amount of time. 
and uh, the house now that house I don't live in anymore but we keep it and do meetings there and um, and you, you That's, know, used to come there that was yeah yeah I mean muckrecovery.com we've been trying to like we made a nonprofit in, the link's going to be in the bio in the description of both the audio and the video mm -hmm. as well so we're going to tag it right there yeah, I mean, and, and you know, like, it's been it's been better and better ever since. Like, you know, there's ups and downs. I've been working on myself. I've been, I do program, you know. I do my steps every day. I, uh, I read my book every day. You see me in the morning here, even on the road. Like, I bring, I don't care how heavy my bag is. Like, I bring my books with me. I bring my notebook. I, uh, I, I write my shit out. I write a letter to God. And, um... And I go to meetings and, and I'm working on myself. Like every day is another challenge. Like every time, as long as I stay sober, like my, my, there's things that come up that are issues. Like we've been talking about different stuff. There's always something. And I, I do the Al-Anon program now also because I have so many alcoholics and addicts in my life, both sober and unsober, you know, that come around. And, um, and I, uh, I have issues. I, I had issues before I ever did drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol were my coping mechanism. That's what I always say is yeah. drugs and alcohol were our solutions to our problems, but not the actual problem. Yeah, I mean, they made the problems worse, so I had to undo all that. And now I'm faced with, like, myself, which is still a problem. Yeah. And, like, dealing with that, it's been, it's been super interesting. And... It, it's been really rewarding. Like I, you know, you know what I do for a living. Like it's fucking amazing. Like I get to go around and make people happy all over the place. And, um, and I love what I do and the creation. Like every time I create something, it reinforces my belief in God. Cause I don't know how to paint. I just know that it happens and I'm like, holy shit. That's awesome. Yeah. Like you, you, yeah. so you look at your own work sometimes, like where did that come from? Like how did I even, cause you don't stencil out. Like people will see your work. Like, you post a wall on your story, and then four hours later, shit, sometimes an hour later, there's ten more stories, and that thing looks amazing, and it's totally transformed. Yeah, and it just happens, you know? It just it just comes out. And, uh, you know, I'm a person in the world with a really big life, and things go bad, and things go well, and, like, both those things, I need to turn over to God, to my higher power, which I never believed in a higher power. Like I said, my first higher power, the first thing I believed in was the people in recovery. Now, when did you start scaring the neighbors? Because, like, when I met, we were, it, that's how we prayed out, was scaring the neighbors with how Satan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when, <clears throat> and do you still scare the neighbors? Well, you know what? I talked to my neighbors, and they were like, oh, we all knew when you got sober. So I think they were probably more scared when there was a circus tent in my yard full of homeless tweakers okay so scare the neighbors so when when we met it was um may 2018 i was a few weeks sober and then i got a sober living and then you started doing my tattoos in your front yard in venice and we would have meetings and just fuck around and talk and it was always a lot of fun dad dad would run around and or he would just lay there with his head on my lap you know and on the meeting Saturday nights, they were really makeshift. They weren't in the big. They weren't in the book for AA. It was just like a bunch of alcoholics getting together. We would talk in a circle, and like I remember the first time I showed up, it was like I wasn't even thirty. I was maybe thirty eight sober, and I sat down my first time like meeting you, and like you're this larger than life person <laughs> to a lot of people, you know, because you do amazing work, yeah. and so like people are like not intimidated but like excited, you know, they don't want to be overexcited. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I wonder, I'm just going to be quiet. And then you walked over, like, hey, your first time here, so you're speaking. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, find something in the book, read it, and then talk about what it, what it means to you, and then we're going to go around a circle, we're all going to talk. And I love that shit. And that's basically what we do here now. You know, that was built from the yard. That's cool. And, you know, I had such a great experience. Uh, I started telling people, like, come with me. This is so cool. Like, it's not even in the book, but, you know, it counts as a meeting. You know, we still pray and we pray out. We scare the neighbors. We do Hell Satan at the end. We don't do Our Father. We do Hell Satan. <laughs> and, you know, it was so, like, different and fun. Um, when did you guys, like, change it to, like, not change it, but, like, progress into, like, oh, this is going to be real, like, real, real, like, muck recovery? What was that? Well, during the pandemic, we had no meetings in L.A. Like, all the meetings got shut down. So, um, I felt... AA was an essential business, and um, and so I opened up the yard to meetings all day, uh, every day, and uh, we started doing meetings every day, 
And, uh, you know, like along the way, like I started feeling uncomfortable living in the house. I was like, I don't know if I can live here anymore. <laughs> people were here all day. There so many people, because I would tour, and then I would come home. They were doing the meetings the whole time. And I would come home, and I, you know, when you're away from a meeting, the meeting changes. And there'd be all these people I didn't even know. You were gone for like three months during quarantine, I feel like. Yeah. I feel like you were like, fuck I was it, on I'm the road. I was here. Time. You saw me. On my birthday. Yeah. yeah you're yeah. like, I felt like you were like, I'm going to take my time on the road because COVID's still out there. And if I'm on the road constantly moving and painting, I'm not going to be like... Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I went home, it was weird. And, yeah. like, it wasn't my home anymore. And um, I had put up with it for a while. People would always tell me, like, why are you doing this? Why are you letting the meetings be here? You have no privacy, blah, 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 blah. But it felt so important to do it that I just ignored it. And I sucked it up. And then, like, you know, it was so crazy because I, um, you know, I'm an artist. So I never had a chance at getting a loan or anything. You know, I never thought that I would be able to, like, get a mortgage and um i remember talking you out of one yeah yeah when well, you were here for my birthday yeah yeah well that was uh, almost one but like the <laughs> fact that i even had the opportunity yeah was for people i met at the rooms you know someone i met in the rooms at the yard actually helped me fix my credit and someone else helped me get a mortgage so i mean people show up for us and uh, I was doing the right thing, and I eventually I got to I got to buy a, a house in coastal California, which was kind of like pretty crazy for a homeless junkie, and um, and uh, you know that's what happened. We got we bought a house, and then and we kept I kept paying the rent at the Venice house for a while, and then slowly like we realized like if we pass a basket, you know, we could collect some of it, and it wasn't really enough, but we started this nonprofit. Mock recovery that also would be able to have, you know, my friend established a 501c3, so it was um, non-profit, so we could give people write-offs, and so we were able to open it up, like, um, to anyone to donate money. It didn't have to just be Seventh Tradition, and that was enough to subsidize what pretty much, at this point, is covering all the rent, which uh, is pretty amazing for Venice, California. I mean... Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's Venice. And we still have, like, you know, because there's meetings, there's, like, coffee, there's all these things. So we're still working yeah. on it, and it's just started, like, last year. The full kind of having a legitimate nonprofit. My friend Mark built the website, and um, it's rocking and rolling. Like, they're doing meetings, like, multiple times a day. You know, like, I don't know, what's today's Thursday? They have, uh, I think they have a noon meeting, and then they, oh, no, today's Friday. Yeah, they have a noon meeting, and then they have a 9 p.m. meeting. Some days there's three meetings. Um, Saturday, if you're in California, definitely, like, in Venice, check it out. There's an 11-11 meeting where there's sound bowl healing. Nicola has That's become, awesome. like, a sound bowl person. You know, you saw her get yeah. sober. Yep. And, um, you know, so they do that meditation meeting. And, uh, you know, it's beautiful, man. I'm super blessed, like, to be able to roll to that house. Whenever I go to that house, there's already people there. Yeah. You know? So, and that's how I always loved it. That's why I had all those fucking tweakers. Because yeah. I wanted people to talk to. But now everybody there is sober. And we're talking about sobriety. And then we hang out. And then we go to a meeting, like, the, right there in the yard. And um, it's amazing that it's worked out. I love the fact that we both work in recovery the way we work in recovery. I love that we're, like, on the ground floor of recovery where the real work is. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, like, like I it's have so a job. Rewarding. I don't want to make money from recovery ever. Yeah. Like, I, I love that it's, like, not draining me to pay the rent. Like, that's freaking nice. I want to get there because we don't, like, locally, L.A. is a lot more progressive when it comes to, like, recovery. Yeah. And what we're, like, here, only one business has been willing to, like, throw us, like, any kind of help. Which business? I'm um, a flower shop. Oh, that's so rad. So, but that's besides cool. that, like, we had, at every business I've called, like, sorry, I can't be a part of what you're doing there. Sorry, I can't be a part of what you're doing there. And it's like, really? We're doing mental health and addiction. What do you mean you can't help us? Like, yeah, well, I mean, people don't understand. Yeah. And, uh, that's probably just because. No, and it is what it is, you know, and I'm going to keep doing it because, you know, I love this. Like, it's, like, it's the most rewarding thing. Like, we talked about the other night, like, I had my sponsee. And the fact that you know, he just had his fifth kid at 32, he just turned 32, he celebrated three months clean on his 32nd birthday. He's been hooked on meds since he was 15 years old. And he just celebrated his first ever three months clean and three months sober. Yeah. He got a Vivitrol shot when he met me. He was like, yeah, you know what? I don't want to drink anymore either. 
and July 4th is his sober date. Aww. And he got to see his fifth kid being born sober. He didn't, none of the other four, he was not sober for. Yeah. And he got to be present completely for his fifth kid, which caused him to throw up, he said. <laughs> but the, the cool thing is, like, he thanked me over and over. You know, his mother-in-law thanked me over and over. His wife, you know, they were all, like, and it felt amazing because I'm not doing this for that, you know? Like, I'm doing this for me, too. Like, this is a selfish thing, too. Yeah, totally. And so, like, to get all this, like, praise, like, I've been a mess crying of just, like, so, <laughs> like, when I, when I, it didn't hit me until I was telling you, and I was like, yeah, he had his baby. And then I was like, wow, that's the first one he'd been there for. Wow, I had something to do with that. And I just started getting really emotional, you know, the other night when I realized that. And then he was thanking me over and over, and, like, it's been overwhelming, but it's that's why I do that shit. That's why I get here at 8, and I open the doors, and I'm here till 9. You know, I'm here 13 hours a day, you know, yeah. five, six days oh, a week. it helps you, too. I mean, it keeps you sober. It just having this yeah. conversation keeps me sober. Like, not that I would be getting high at 4.30 in the morning well, or whatever know. time it is, you know <laughs> what I mean? But, like, it's the point of this kind of conversation will keep me sober without a doubt for, like, another six months. You know, you just know, on this kind of, con like, uh, high alone. connection with the other people. That's, yeah, I mean, I think that's the magic for and sure. And speaking of connection, the higher power thing. Yeah. So, like, because you had said the first time you weren't really, you were needing a higher power but not wanting a higher power. So... Because that, that story, uh, like, what happened when you went to, when you were in Greece and you weren't, because you didn't grow up with a religion. Yeah, no, I didn't. I told you, like, when, when I was younger, I remember my parents tried to bring me to Greek church because I was Greek, but, like, you, know, you have to stand for a long time. Like I was saying, like, you have to stand in the aisle when you're a kid. And I vomited. Like, it was early in the morning, like, both times. So after that, they didn't make me go to church anymore. They, they didn't want to be the parents with the kid that throws up in the church that's rejecting God. Yeah. <laughs> and I always, I was like that. I was like, you know, as I grew into a teenager, oh, religion is the opiate of the masses. You know, like, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. As you're using opiates. I know, exactly. Like, so stupid. But I was really against it. I haven't had a, a shirt that said, I am God. You know, like, I thought that it started and ended with me. And I was responsible for me, and nothing was going to help me but me. And that was my perspective until the crack, the crack in, the, in my resolve happened when I told you those people stuck up for me and had my back. Mm -hmm. And so I started to rely on other people, other alcoholics. They didn't fuck me over. And then I started to rely on a higher power through them. And I was just told in AA to pray, pray on your knees, just do it. It's good for your humility. And I'd pray out loud on my knees. And like, lo and behold, that kind of like regimen as it started became a beautiful thing. And now, you know, I rely completely, you know, I let go of everything. The, I do have to remind myself sometimes at night like when I'm worried about things that I don't have to worry everything has worked out perfectly you know and so many times I've had these anxieties of like what's gonna happen oh I gotta make sure this happens and like you know what I don't gotta make sure anything like I do the next right thing and uh, and I'm always taken care of a good orderly direction good orderly direction no, that's a lot of people's higher power at first because they're like they have a problem with God and someone's and I heard someone say like don't call it God and think about God. Think of it as an acronym, Good Orderly Direction. Yeah, or group of drunks, go outdoors. Of, I didn't hear that one. <laughs> Do you have any, like, times where going through the steps, it was a different, like, it's always different for me. Like, you always get something different out of it. But was there one time where it was like, holy shit, this is like, that. Well, every time that I do it, it gets better. And, like, this last time... Um, I really love my sponsor. My new sponsor is amazing. And uh, I've got her in the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, this time going through the steps, I think because I had such a belief in my higher power, such a God reliance, that like when I did like six and seven, like I started crying because I really felt like I could let go of my protective mechanisms, which I, my character defects, what I need to survive and to like protect from fear. I was really willing to let him go. I was trusted. I trusted my higher power. Yeah, and, and that's funny because I had such a problem with six, with le with letting with with my character defects. Like, 
my spitefulness and my manipulation. They were my two biggest ones. And, you know, spiteful, I'm still working on. You know, yeah. I'm still working on it. And I'll catch myself. I try to be conscious, like, nope, don't be spiteful. You know, I don't want to do that and go down that path. You know, because I know where it takes me. Yeah. The manipulation of early on is, like, I had to work on that. That one I had to work on because I was manipulating people for drugs. You know what I mean? The spitefulness, that just takes me out down a bad path. But the manipulation, that's really bad. So I had to work on that, but I was worried because I also worked in sales. And sales is getting... Yeah. yeah. And so I always said to like my sponsor and my therapist, like I'm not manipulating, I'm a salesman. And then my therapist said, well, then use your powers for good. If you're manipulating to help serve somebody else and not serve yourself, that's going to be acceptable. But if you're manipulating to only serve you, that's when it's going to be a problem for you. And I was like, okay, now I get it. She was like, when you're selling a TV, you're not watching that TV. And I was like, oh, shit, okay, I get it. You know, because I was selling TVs, I was selling plumbing. Yeah. You know, and I wasn't using their plumbing after I sold them the job. So she was right. I wasn't being self-serving when I was selling them stuff. They were getting the benefits from it. But when I was manipulating for drugs, I was only seeing the benefits. Yeah. So she helped me, you know, break that through so I could kind of separate the two yeah. ways. And now, like, my manipulation is helping people with what recovery can look like because there's a lot of stigmas around addiction and recovery still. So I would like to use the manipulation to help people now so they can help at least get away from their drugs of choice and start making the right steps. Because yeah. it's an amazing thing to see that I didn't expect sobriety would give me the opportunity to see other people get sober too. You know, and, yeah, it's beautiful. And it's definitely a huge gift. And sitting down with you is a huge gift. We sit down and talk all the time, and we're going to probably do our own meeting again yeah. before you leave because that's fun for me. But, like, <laughs> thank you for at least doing this. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it so much and all the work and the shit we did around town yesterday was so, so fun. fun. Yeah. yeah. Awesome.